Hi guys, so today's lecture is going to uh, be the last lecture. i um, going to be introducing you to uh, a more advanced data structure called the hash table. Um, this data structure functions uh, very differently than the previous data structures that I've introduced you to. So the stack, the queue, the array list, and the linked list. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and dive into the slides here. So a hash table is a data structure that stores unordered items by mapping uh, or hashing each item to a location in an array. Um, so this brings up some interesting points here. So the underlying structure for a hash table is uh, an array. Um, it has unordered items. And it uses this mapping or hashing, whatever that might be. Um, and we'll actually go over that shortly here, what that is. So in a hash table, an item's key is the value used to map to an index. Um, so th this will make a little more sense in a second here when we start talking about what a hash function is. Um, but the key thing to note is that there's this thing called a key, and the key is used to access an index in the array. For all items that might possibly be stored in the hash table, every key is ideally unique so that the hash table algorithm can search for a specific item by using that key. And we'll, we'll come back to this slide to revisit these um, comments when, when they make a little more sense here. So the key does not necessarily need to be a number. Um, it can also, and very commonly is, uh, a string. And so Elements are inserted into a hash table as part of a pairing called a key-value pair. Um, the idea of this key-value pair is this key is somehow magically mapped to an index in the array. And what gets stored in the array is uh, the value associated with that key. Um, so looking at this example here, uh, an example of a key-value pair might be, uh, and we can see here, this is a string, and here I've just said special unique key. And this, you know, what's important is that it's a string here. Your, your key really could have been anything. Uh, I've chosen the string special unique key, but you could have done hello world, um, you could have done foo bar, um, whatever, right? And the value here is this, is this number. Uh, you know, 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, 5, 3, 2. And in this case, the key is a string, and so the key is normally, uh, almost always, when you think of the key value pair, it's what's on the left here, and the key is the string, and the value associated with the key is an integer, um, this number right here. And so what will get stored inside of the array, inside of our hash table, would be this value right here. Each hash table array element is called a bucket. And so oftentimes when talking about arrays, right, we, uh, I talk about the individual elements or, or cells in an array. In this case, the abstraction is a bucket. And so here's the hash function. Uh, a hash function computes a bucket index from an item's key. And so, you know, this is, this is a, a key part, part of the hash table is this ha hash function is it, and its ability to take some sort of key, whether that's a string or an integer or whatever it might be, and convert it into an index. And, and at that index resi resides a bucket, right? And that bucket should hold some sort of value or will hold some sort of value. A common and easy hash function uses the modulo operator, so that percent sign, 
which computes the integer remainder when dividing two numbers. So, um, for example here, if we have a 20 element hash table, in other words, our, our hash table can, has a capacity or can hold up to 20 elements, a hash function of key modulo 20 will map keys to bucket indices 0 through 19. Um, this is a convenient thing that moduloing with the size of your, your array uh, does, is that the result will always, um, because the result is a remainder, the remainder can never exceed uh, what you're moduloing by. So in this case, it will never exceed 20. Um, and here, key, uh, you know, of course, key here should be an, a number, um, but that doesn't mean it can't be a string originally and then get converted into a number. And so here is uh, an example, right? Starting from the top here, we have our key value pairs. Here, we can see here the key here. In this case, I've uh, flipped from our original example. The key is a number and our value is a string. And this is perfectly okay. Again, a key value pair here, a key value pair here, and a key value pair here. In this case, the key is an integer and the value is a string. Um, and if you look down at the bottom here, here is our array and the associated indices. And our hashing function is going to be whatever the key is modulo with 9. Why 9? Well, because the capacity of our array is 9. It can hold uh, up to 9 elements. And so applying the hashing function to each key, um, you can see here I have 23, 45, 62, and 13. These are all of the keys in our key value pairs. And I'm going to apply the hashing function to each key. So 23 modulo 9 results in a remainder of 5. 45 modulo 9 results in a remainder of 0. 62 modulo 9 results in a remainder of 8. And 13 modulo 9 results in a remainder of 4. Now these remainders here um, are the indices that we're going to use to map our value uh, into our array. So, looking at the very first key, um, our value, string 1, is going to go into the bucket at index 5. So we go to index 5 and we can see, okay, I put the value associated with the first key um, at its appropriate index. Going to the next key value pair, 45 modulo 9 is equal, uh, is equal to 0, it has no remainder. And once again, the value for this key pair, in this case, string 2, gets mapped to the bucket at index 0. And here we, here we have it, right? String 2 is now at index 0. And the same goes for this key value pair and the following key value pair, both of the values string 3 and string 4 get mapped to the appropriate indices calculated by the hashing function, in this case uh, index 8 for string 3 and index 4 for string 4. Um, so going back a few slides, some of the comments should make a, a little more sense. In a hash table, an item's key is the value used to map to an index. So this mapping to an index is that hash function. And for all items that might possibly be stored in the hash table, every key is ideally unique. Um, so that the hash table algorithm can search for a specific item by using that key. Um, yeah, so it, it would make sense, right, that we would want every key uh, to be unique and therefore um, that hashing function also to to produce unique indices, otherwise it's possible two values might map to the exact same index. 
So we'll look at Java's documentation on the hash table here. Um, I have uh, an interesting thing to, to note immediately is we see here, so class, hash table, angle brackets, KV. This is Java generics, right? And here is a use of um, the generic types. Uh, and in this case, they've uh, specified K and V. And if you recall on the generics lecture that um, there are different uh, naming conventions when it comes to generics in Java. K represented key and V represents value. So what does this mean? Well, what, what, what this means is when you use a hash table or a Java's hash, hash table in particular, uh, you're going to want to specify the types uh, for your key and your value. And so here they talk about the type parameters, K, the type of keys maintained by this map, and V, the type of mapped values. Um, if we scroll down here, you can see that there's a lot of nice methods. The two that we're going to focus on are get. So if we look at get here, it returns the value to which the specified key is mapped, or null, if this map contains no mapping for the key. So you can see get's input parameter here is uh, key, and the output is type v, some value that is associated with that key. The other method that we're going to look at is called put. So right here, put, maps the specified key to the specified value in this hash table. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to take the key, we're going to apply the hash function, um, that hash function will give us a unique index, and at that index we'll add this value to the bucket. Um, and in this case it returns the value that we're adding. So going back to the slides, um, oh, and one more thing I wanted to address, um, that Java's hash table is um, actually somewhat deprecated. Um, as of Java 2 platform uh, version 1.2, this class was retrofitted to implement the map interface, making it a member of Java Collections Framework. Unlike the new collection implementations, hash table is synchronized. If a thread safe implementation is not needed, it is recommended to use hash map in place of hash table. So um, the difference between hash map and hash table, um, and the main reason why I'm addressing this is because you probably come across this at some point. Uh, the difference between hash map and hash table is negligible to you guys for now. Um, there are differences, um, but it has to do with threads and synchronization, things that you guys don't really need to worry about at your current level of computer scientists. So you can think of a hash map and a hash table as being relatively the same. So anyways, going back to the slides. So yeah, using hash tables, uh, when using Java's built-in hash table, be sure to properly specify the types for the key and the value. Java's hash table has many useful methods, but we're going to take a look at uh, two of them, get and put, that I previously talked about on um, Java's documentation. Get gets the value associated with a key from the hash table. Um, so if you recall, get had an input parameter of the being the key and an output of uh, being a value. Put adds a value into the hash table given the key. So put had two input parameters, key and value, and given that key, it's going to um, find the index using a hash function and put the value into the hash table. And so here I have a simple example of using Java's hash table. Um, <clears throat> just like any array list that you've probably used in the past, here I am declaring hash table. In this case, I use the Java generics. String will replace the K, meaning that I want my key to be of type string. An integer will replace the v, meaning I want my values to be integers. 
Um, and this is my variable name, my hash table. And here I'm instantiating a hash table object. Now I'm going to call the put method on my hash table. And so we can see here's the two inputs to the put method. The first is the key, which is why it's a string. And I've called it my special key. Um, once again, the string could really be anything. You just want to try and keep your keys relatively unique. And the value associated with that key is this number here, one, two, three, four. And then below that line, uh, I call system.out.println my hash table dot get. So I'm calling the get method. And I'm giving it an input of the key. And what it's going to do is use that key to find the associated value within our hash table. Um, I have some explicit code to run for you, just so you can see this actually working. Um, here, it's basically the same code as what you saw before, except for I added one more put line just to show you that you can have, you know, multiple things inside of your hash table, and it, uh, it works as you would expect it to work. One important thing is that you need to import the java.util.hash table in order to use the hash table objects um, or class. So I'll go ahead and run this. So in this case, we're getting the my value associated with my special key, which uh, so what gets returned by this get method should be one, two, three, four. So we'll go ahead and run this. And indeed, it returns one, two, three, four. Now, if I change what I'm getting from one key to a different key, in this case, the other key is some other key, then it should give us the other value. waiting for it to run. There we go. And indeed it gives us uh, the other value. And so you can see this is how a hash table works. Um, it is associating some values, in this case integers, with some sort of keys, in this case strings. Going back to the slides. So um, the issue with using modulo as a hashing function is that it does not really produce unique values. Um, so look, for example, if we take 5 modulo 20, the result is 5. Um, and if we take 25 modulo 20, the result is also 5. So if we think of this in terms of the hash table, we have some key here that's an integer that's 5. And we're applying our hash function to find the appropriate index or bucket. And we find that it results in index 5. But if we take a completely different key, in this case also an integer uh, value 25, and apply our same hash function, it also results in the same index. When two keys map to the same location, we call this a collision. Um, and so this is what a lot of the hash table algorithms have to deal with, is how do we handle when our hashing function takes two different keys and yet maps them to the same bucket? Um, in other words, how do we handle collisions? And so there are various techniques uh, that are used to handle collisions, um, such as chaining uh, or slash and open addressing. Um, chaining is a collision resolution technique where each bucket has a list of items. So in other words, uh, a bucket at index five uh, would ho hold a list, and that list would become 55 uh, and 75. So um, this is relating to a past example. Uh, in other words, it's an array of lists. And we'll go into more detail what chaining is in a second here. Open addressing uh, is also called probing. Um, and this is a collision resolution technique where collisions are resolved by looking for an empty bucket elsewhere in the table. Um, 
And so it does not have an array of lists. Instead, it keeps its array of values and it just finds the next empty bucket to uh, put this new incoming value that's already been mapped uh, or been mapped to a bucket that already holds a value. And we'll look at more in depth uh, how probing works in a second here. So we're, we're going to start with chaining. Uh, chaining handles hash table collisions by using a list for each bucket, where each list may store multiple items that map to that same bucket. Um, the insert operation first uses the items uh, key to determine the bucket um, using the hash function, right? So the hash function will take the key and calculate an, an index. Um, that index uh, maps to the bucket, right? And then what it's going to do is insert the item uh, and its key. So, and this is an important distinction. Now with chaining, we need to store both the key and the value. Um, and it's going to add that key value into the buckets list. Now, why are we storing the key and the value? Well, let's say uh, we're going to search using a key um, for some sort of value inside of our hash table. Well, what happens is searching first uh, determines the bucket by using that hashing function on the key. And, and then what it needs to do is linearly traverse through the list checking each key in that list um, for the one that matches what you're currently uh, looking for, right? And then what you do is you return the value associated with that key. So we'll go ahead and look at an example of this. Um, we're going to look at uh, Zybooks. <clears throat> Before we start looking at this, uh, Zybooks um, kind of dumps things down a little bit for you guys. Um, and, they, and they basically say your key and value are one and the same. Um, so in other words, you're, yeah, your, your key and your value are the same thing, which is not the case in reality. In reality, in reality you have a key and a value pair. Um, and so basically, you know, they're going to use this key value um, to both map to an index and store something into the hash table. So we'll look at this uh, example here. Here we have our array with the indices on the sides. Um, and if we look down at the bottom here, we have uh, the hash insert function. So this hash insert function uh, is trying to insert um, this key value 77 uh, into the hash table. Um, And so what it's going to do is apply the ha a hash function to 77, which, um, as it turns out, maps it to index 7 here. And it's going to add it to the list at this bucket. And so you can see here this, this list here. Um, it's actually a linked list that they're using. And yeah, so it adds it to the list here. The next function call they make is hash insert uh, uh, item 8, so the key value is 8 here. They apply the hash function, which results in the mapping of the key value 8 to index 8, and they add it to the list. Now looking at the comment here, right, uh, a bucket may store multiple items with different keys that map to the same bucket. If collisions occur, items are inserted in the bucket's list. So in this case, they're attempting to insert uh, item 17. Uh, we apply the hash function to item 17, and it maps to index 7. Well, originally, right, something would already have existed at index 7, and so we would have had a collision. But since we have a list here, we can now simply add 17 to that list, and the collision is avoided. Now, um, in this case, uh, we're going to apply a hash search, which is going to search for, in this case, the um, item 17. Uh, search first uses the item's key to determine the mapped bucket, and then searches the items in that bucket's list. So it takes 17, 
it applies the hash function which maps to index 7 and then it takes the list found at that bucket and will linear, linearly begin to search through that list looking for the key value. And so it, it compares 17 to 77. Uh, 17 is not 77, so obviously that, that uh, returns false. It moves on to the next node, compares 17 to 17, and indeed finds um, 17. And so it returns 17. So going back to the slides, um, the underlying structure for a hash table uh, using chaining is an array of lists. Now, uh, here's what that might look like, right? Uh, here I've, I'm just specifying the list interface, um, and it's going to be an array of lists. In this case, I'm calling them buckets. And what I'm instantiating here is a link, an array of linked lists. Um, now there is some missing information here, right? For example, what is this linked list? What is each linked list going to hold? And I'll let you think about that, but uh, presumably we want something that can hold a key and a value pair. So moving on to the um, other method of handling collisions, uh, linear probing. Uh, a hash table with linear prob probing handles a collision by starting at the key's mapped bucket. And then it linearly searches subsequent buckets until an empty bucket is found. Um, and so yeah, that's the idea, right? Is Okay, so we're given this key. We're going to apply our hash function on this key to get some sort of uh, unique index. We go to that bucket and okay, we find out that there's something already in that bucket. And so this algorithm, basically what it does, is it goes to the next available bucket and checks to see if that bucket is empty as well, or if that bucket is empty. If it's not empty, it moves on to the next bucket and so on and so forth. Uh, but if that bucket is empty, what it does is it adds the element into that bucket. Linear probing distinguishes two types of empty buckets. An empty sense start bucket, uh, which has been empty since the hash table was created. And the other type of empty bucket is an empty after removal bucket, uh, which means it's at some point in the lifetime of this hash table has contained uh, an element or a key value at, at the bucket uh, but that key value is now removed, and so it's empty, but at some point in its lifetime it did indeed contain uh, some sort of element. Now why are they specifying two different types? Well that's how the algorithm works. Uh, the distinction is important during searches, um, and the, this algorithm's stopping condition for its searching is looking for an empty sense start bucket. Um, not the empty after removal bucket. So we'll go ahead and look at an example of this to see um, how this works. We'll go back to Zybooks, click on uh, linear probing. And so what, what we're going to start off looking at is um, just a simple uh, insertion into a hash table using linear probing. So we'll go ahead and start, and so using the hash, hash insert function, you can see um, that in our hash table we're going to try and add the item uh, or key value 124. So the key and the value are both 124. We apply a hash function, which in this case they're doing key modulo 10, and so 124 modulo 10 is equivalent to 4. So we go to index 4, and we look at the bucket at index 4 and it already contains a key value there, in this case 34. And so we now have detected a collision. Um, and so the idea is we're going to use linear probing uh, 
to continue to check for the next empty bucket um, until eventually an empty bucket is found, and then that's where we're going to add the 124. Conveniently, in our case, we go to the next bucket, and it is indeed an empty bucket. And so that's where the 124 will be placed. So the item is inserted into the next empty bucket, and that bucket is no longer empty. And so looking at the hash search in this case, um, once again, we take the key 124, so that's what we're looking for. Uh, we apply the hash function to it, 124 modulo 10, um, which results in index 4. So we go to index 4 and we check the bucket, and what we do is we check the bucket's key value against the one that we're currently searching for, which is in this case 124. So is 34 equivalent to 124? The answer is no. And so then what we do is we linear, linearly search each bucket after um, that original bucket um, until we find 124 or until we find uh, an empty sense start bucket. In our case, conveniently, the next bucket is 124, and so our hash search returns true. Well, but we will find, or returns the item, but what we will find is the next hash search is for an item that isn't contained within uh, our hash table. And so you can see applying the hash function to 33 here results in index 3. And starting at index 3, we check and compare the key value here, 113, to 33. 113, of course, is not 33, so we check the subsequent bucket, which is, has a key value of 34. 33 is not 34, so we check the subsequent bucket after that, which is 124. 33 is not 124, and so we check the subsequent bucket after that, which is an empty sense start bucket. Um, and that signifies the stop for our hash search function. Um, why does it signify at the end? Well, if we think about it, according to our linear probing methodology here, if 33 indeed does exist in the hash table, then it would have existed in this empty bucket. It would have been added into this empty bucket. Um, but since it hasn't been, right, this bucket, bucket remains empty. And so we'll continue playing this just to finish it out. So yeah, you can see if an empty bucket is found, search returns null, indicating a matching item was not found. Um, so this particular example doesn't address uh, empty sense start and empty sense removal explicitly, but the next few will. And so here's insert uh, with linear probing, and we can see here uh, any bucket that is white Will, be rep or rep uh, will represent an empty sense start bucket. Any bucket that is gray will represent empty after removal. And any bucket um, with this tan orange color uh, will represent uh, a bucket that's occupied. So starting off, we can see our hash table is already pre-populated with some sort of values. And here, we're calling hash insert, inserting this key value of 42. We can see here that a hash function is applied to the key value 42, in which the hash function modulos uh, the key by 10, resulting in index 2. So we go to this index 2 and we check the bucket, and the bucket already contains a value. It contains 202. And so following our linear probing algorithm, what we do is we go to the next empty bucket, and that's where the item or the key value will be inserted. Um, we'll go ahead and play. Conveniently, the next bucket is an empty bucket, and so that's where the 42 will uh, be placed. And so yeah, that's what this comment is saying down here, right? Insert linearly probes uh, or checks each bucket until an empty bucket is found. 
and you can see that the next bucket is empty. In fact, empty since start, and it gets placed with the 42, which changes, you can see it changes the color, um, and it to occupy. And then the next call we make is a hash insert on our same hash table. In this case, inserting 19, a key value of 19. And so 19 modulo 10 results in index 9, which, as we can see here, this bucket already contains a key value of 89. It's already occupied. And so now what happens is we restart back to the top of the array, or beginning of the array. In other words, at index 0. And so we check what's at index zero, and we can see that there's also something already here at index zero. And so we, then we must move on to the next bucket at index one, which conveniently is empty. And so this is where the 19 will be placed. So here we go. We can see the 19 gets placed into index 1 and the color changes to occupy. Now what we haven't quite seen yet is the use of the empty since start or empty after removal um, uh, in conjunction with uh, stopping the algorithm. So we'll, that's what we're going to see here um, after we see this um, how to remove a bucket with linear probing. So here we, we see a, our hash table pre-populated with some elements. We're going to call a hash remove function on our hash table. In this case, trying to remove uh, the value, key value 22. And so what happens here is uh, 202, uh, we apply our hash function. So 202 modulo 10, which results in, a, in index 2. We go to that index and look at the bucket, and we check to see if that bucket contains 202, in which case it does. And so what we will do is we will remove 202, and we change this bucket from occupied to empty after removal. So yeah, that's what you're seeing here. Um, and there you go. The bucket is changed to gray, representing empty after removal. And so the next uh, remove we're going to do is removing 19 from our hash table. Uh, the, if we read the comment at the bottom here, the remove algorithm probes each bucket until either the matching item or an empty sense start bucket is found. In our case, 19, we apply our hash function, so 19 modulo 10, which is equivalent to 9. So we go to index 9, and we see that the uh, value stored at the bucket at index 9 uh, is 89. And checking uh, or comparing, 89 is not equivalent to 19, so that means we uh, need to continue on searching for 19. We check the next bucket, which means we loop back, since we're at the end of the array, we loop back to the beginning of the array at index 0. We check the bucket at index 0 and we see it contains a key value of 10, which is not 19. So once again we move on to the next bucket at index 1, which, can, which does indeed contain 19. And so 19 uh, will then get removed and the bucket will change from this tan uh, orange representing occupied to a gray representing empty after removal. So we'll go ahead and play this all the way through. Um, so while this is going on, um, if for some reason we had tried to remove something that uh, did not exist inside of our hash table, then what would have happened was uh, we would have uh, you know, checked, say 19 was not what we were looking for, we would have checked the next bucket, and we would have seen that it was an empty after removal bucket, uh, meaning that we would have just simply moved on, checked the next bucket, and if the next bucket also did not contain what we were looking for, we would have checked the subsequent bucket, 
which, was, which is an empty sense start, meaning our search can end. And just to finish off this example here, we find the 19, and 19 gets removed. Okay, and in the last example here, uh, we're going to do searching with linear probing, which is basically the same thing we've been doing with remove. Um, and that is, you know, finding uh, where this key value might exist and stopping if we hit an empty sense start bucket. So we go ahead and apply a hash search to our hash table looking for the item for the key value 42. We apply our hash function, in this case modulo 10, to our key, which is 42, um, and that results in an index of 2. So we go to index 2 and we look at the bucket there and we see that the value is 202, which is not 42. And so what we're going to do is continue our linear search to the next bucket or the subsequent bucket, uh, which is in this case at index 3. And we check the key value at index 3, and we see that it has a value of 42. And 42 is indeed what we're looking, so, uh, looking to, uh, for, so we will return 42. And so yeah, that's what this is saying at the bottom here. The search algorithm uses the saw items key to determine the initial bucket, and then linearly probes each bucket until a matching item is found or, and they didn't include this, or an empty sense start bucket is reached. And so uh, this next search, looking for a key value of 19, uh, shows the effect of skipping over an empty after removal bucket. 19 applying the hash function results in 9, so we start at 9, index 9, we check the bucket, 89 is not 19, so we move back to the beginning of the array. But since the beginning of the array holds an empty after removal bucket, um, that means we can simply just skip it. Uh, since it's not an empty sense start, and it certainly does not contain any elements. So we probe the next bucket, which indeed contains 19, um, and that will signify the end of our search. Now this last hash search is going to be very interesting because we're going to, going to be looking for uh, a key value that does not exist within our hash table. So our 115 here, we apply our hash function, um, which modulos with 10, resulting in 5. We go to bucket 5, and we compare what's at bucket 5 to the item we're looking for. 85 does not equal 115, so we check the next bucket. But the next bucket is an empty sense start bucket, which signifies the end of the search. Because um, this bucket is truly empty, and if 115 had been added to the hash table, it would have been found at this bucket. Um, Just to show you, there's other uh, types of probing. So there's something called quadratic probing that we're not going to get into. Uh, there's also something called double hashing that we're not going to get into. Um, but yeah, and so that's the end of uh, this lecture.